I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Got space, man. Huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi everyone! Well, 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 you're watching once again the Wrestle Rock Podcast. My name is Jonathan, aka Childish Ryan, and I am with my partner, Benoit, aka Nostradamus. Ben, are you doing, my friend, today? Fine, uh, I'm very proud to be there uh, because it's, uh, it's our uh, first interview since uh, three months. Yes, exactly, exactly, and we have none other than. Uh, an American actor born in Orange, Virginia, he is known for his role as villains in action character in various films and television series. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Kilpatrick, uh, who had a long career in the uh, entertainment, uh, entertainment industry, and he uh, worked for Toxic Avenger, Death Warrant with John claude Van Damme. Uh, Eraser, uh, Minority with uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Star Trek, Last Man Standing, and many other uh, entertaining projects. So, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. Glad to be with you. Yeah, this Thank is you super so much cool, for the honestly, interview. That you accept our invitation. Uh, we know that you are very busy with a lot of stuff. And uh, we go forward with a little question. So go ahead, my friend. Yes, of course. Uh, Mr. Kilpatrick, I'm going to start with a simple question. Uh, how is your health uh, today? Uh, my health is very good. Um, I've always maintained a uh, fairly healthy lifestyle. Um, uh, you know, you have to continue to work on things like flexibility and movement. So I try to go swimming uh, as much as possible. And uh, as you can see, I, I've got a gym, so I'm usually doing something yeah, yeah. lightweights. Um, I probably should do more yoga and that kind of thing, but I get the uh, flexibility and stretching from swimming. Uh, okay. I eat very, very well. I've never been a big drinker. Um, so <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in pretty good nick, as they say. That's super cool. And uh, you're growing up in uh, Connecticut. Um, <laughs> are you a wrestling fan? Because uh, if you know what I mean, uh, the WWE headquarters are in Stanford, you know. Well, you know, I did grow up in Connecticut, and I certainly know where Stanford is. But Stanford is like another world. Um, <laughs> okay. that, that is uh, down near the border, close to New York City. And I grew up in the very, very rural countryside up okay. in the up in the northwest corner. Um, so it's a, it's a, it, I don't think I even went to New York City until I was about 14 years old. So okay. um, Stanford is mostly a bedroom community for New York City, okay. uh, where people commute in to work. So I was not aware. I mean, I was aware of wrestling. Well, I, I, I'm so ancient uh, at this juncture that the um, wrestling was done a lot at Madison Square Garden when I was growing up. And my first uh, recollection of wrestling was when a performer named Haystack Calhoun uh, fought the Seven Dwarfs okay. um, wow. at Madison Square Garden, which, uh, you know, it was very much a spectacle. It was considered, I have immense respect for wrestlers because the athleticism and the danger level of what they're doing mm -hmm. uh, is considerable, as you well know. I played wrestlers. I played a, a wrestler uh, on uh, Arliss. I don't know if you know that TV show, but okay. I played a wrestler. I'm sorry I didn't send you that picture because you might have enjoyed it, but... Um, 
Maybe I can get Maria when she comes into the office to send you that picture. Um, I played a hockey player who was expelled okay. from high hockey for fighting, and so he became a professional wrestler. Wow. So um, do I follow it beyond? I don't. I follow UFC and mixed martial arts and uh, lately very extensively boxing. I've been watching all the YouTube fights from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, because I'm preparing to write something about boxing. But um, of course, uh, you know, I'm aware of The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, which was a great yeah. film. Uh, very nice movie, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. my memory is good. He won yeah, very uh, nice movie. an award for this movie. Yeah, an Oscar. He, he won an Oscar, an Academy Award uh, for it. Um, and it was a brilliant movie. Um, I, 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 I really, I want to say I totally admire wrestlers because now the level of athleticism and, and danger, really, of what they do is really quite extraordinary. So... Uh, I've met, had the privilege of meeting Randy Macho Savage and a lot of those guys on Arliss because they were playing themselves. Okay. And they were really great actors within the confines of the one character that they played, their, their one persona, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and it was very much an acting of them. So, uh, yeah, so a lot of, uh, lots of respect for them. Go ahead. Okay, and Mr. Kilpatrick, uh, uh, what inspired way, you? I, I, I just wanted to add, what uh, wrestlers do is not unlike what we do in movies when we do stunt choreography and, and fighting. Yeah. It's a it very is, similar uh, dance. Very similar yeah. because when you punch some someone, uh, you need to uh, to extend your movement. Uh, it's sure. it's uh, a little bit the same thing on on uh, during a situation for a movie recording. So uh, yeah, sometimes I mean, by accident yeah. is uh, for real. Yeah. By accidentally, yeah, it's for well, real. We all we all get hit uh, now and then. Um, I've hit some people and I've gotten hit, but it's not a lot, and it's 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 just part of the game. Uh, doing your own stunts as I did yeah. a lot. Uh, in fact, I'm still I'm doing a movie right now I'm directing and uh, I wrote and starring in called Dying for Living and you have the, the teaser there. Uh, I did, I'm doing my own stunts and that. So don't even have a stunt double. So um, I still uh, like to do that aspect of stuff. Of course, the biggest example of that is Tom Cruise. Now he's taken it to a level that's just crazy, but, uh, or, extraordinary um so there you go a lot of similarities between wrestling and and uh, uh film choreography and fighting yeah of course uh mr kilpatrick uh, what inspired you to become uh, an actor well i um i was a journalist and an advertising writer for years in new york for magazines and uh I kind of I had done that. I was at the top of the heap. I worked at Time Incorporated for all, all the top magazines. And I was looking for something different. So I, uh, I took a break from that to write a novel. Um, and I, to save money, I moved out of New York City and into a house uh, with uh, an actor who was becoming a big Broadway director a guy named John Tillinger, and uh, he hired me for 200 bucks a month to babysit his kids while he directed a play, and I was writing this novel. And so uh, I ended up at the Williamstown Theater Festival watching big-time actors like Richard Dreyfuss, and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was 12 years old at the time, but her mom, oh. Blythe Danner, and... Christopher Reeves, who played Superman later, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of famous actors. That's where they go to do plays during the summer. And so I watched the process a lot. And so instead of a novel, I wrote a play and the play got produced in New York and 
I was asked to join theater companies and I started acting and I found I liked it. Really, it's not so different in a lot of ways from athletics because, and I'd been a journalist where I was writing my own script and doing the story in front of the camera. Or if you're a football player, you're prepping and then you're going out on a stage or field to perform. So it, it's not a dissimilar process. I was sort of always performing with athletics. Uh, we are talking about uh, your uh, debut because uh, you're starting your uh, your career around mid '80s, and you played a villain called Leroy in the Toxic Avenger yeah. of 1984. Well, uh, can you share with us uh, this uh, wonderful memory? Well, <laughs> actually, I had been acting in films at, at New York University for okay. a couple of years uh, and doing the theater work for since about 82. So I had about two years where I was doing theater okay. and I was doing a lot of student films at NYU. And then I, I saw a little ad for Toxic Avenger and I went up there. And to me, it was, I thought, just sort of a, a glorified student film okay. uh but it ended up being this cult phenomenon um i had a lot of memories in the my book i talk about yeah uh, a lot of the adventures on that film <laughs> it was a pretty funny job because I imagine. for example um you know i thought it was like the worst movie in the history of mankind uh but of course it struck a cultural chord and became a huge success. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it was funded by some mob money <laughs> at the time. Uh, and the ingenue was the girlfriend of the older guy who supplied the money, which is not unusual. And uh, so um, uh, I had a lot of adventures on there and I, I'll refer people to the, book, uh, my memoir, Dying for Living, for that. But um, what was interesting about it was I did that movie, and I also, you know, public broadcasting, you have it. You're in Montreal, correct? Yes. Uh, right. We are in Quebec City at three hours of Montreal. So okay. We are French-Canadian. So they have public broadcasting, Canadian uh, uh public broadcasting too and but so it's considered like high end you know a, a sort of elite entertainment well toxic avenger took a couple of years to come out after we filmed it so i opened the new york times and there was a review on one side of toxic avenger and on the other side a review of this big production called roanoke that i did for pbs So at, right at that moment, I realized there was a place in film for every kind of taste because they both got good reviews, mm -hmm. but they were at uh, completely different ends of the cinematic experience. Uh, exactly. Exactly. I, I, I got killed, I think, by being turned into a human milkshake on that one, <laughs> uh, which was hysterical. And then they, they had a guy who loses his arms and his legs. Uh, so they hired a real veteran who had no arms. So they would just pull his... I mean, it was pretty funny to watch what they did to put together the uh, the, the, the film. Like the character of Richter in uh, Total Recall, when Michael Ironside lost his arms... Uh... Yeah, they. <laughs> he wasn't a prosthesis. They yeah. actually hired a guy who had no arms, so they took it off. Uh, of course, that film. If you watch what I did, I was actually sort of stealing a bit from Malcolm McDowell's portrayal in the movie If, uh, it, it, by and uh, with the you know paint half of your face painted and stuff like that. And also borrowing a, a little stuff from uh, what uh, Clockwork Orange. 
you know. Um, so, you know what if they say, if you're going to steal something, steal it from really good people. So uh, I had fun. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Terrorizing babies and stuff. Okay. <laughs> In the 1990, uh, 1990, sorry, how did you get the role of Christian the Sandman Nailer in the movie that Warren, of also starring uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme? Bring me a dream, Burke. Bring me a dream. Yeah. <laughs> you remember uh, that? I, of course I remember. Yeah, I still get recognized for that one all the time. Um, I, I auditioned for it. You know, I, I went in and there was Jean-Claude Van Damme and the producer... Uh, Mark LaSalle or, okay. uh, was there and I auditioned and got the part. Um, it's interesting, Darren Serafian, the director of that, is working with me on a project right now called uh, Flight 2222, um, a sort of elevated horror film. And I reconnected with Darren and he's now going to direct a script uh, that I wrote. Uh, uh, a really fun project, sort of kind of a karmic horror story, but it was just a straight up audition, mm -hmm. you know, mostly an actor's life, uh, particularly when you're starting out is audi auditioning, you know, you, you go in and do what you do. And so I was pretty skilled at that because I made it my business to be a good auditioner. If you aren't, you don't work a lot. So, um, And I wanted to work a lot, so uh, that that's really cool because the perfect asset for being a good actor is uh, being a chameleon, and oh, yeah. you can do it perfectly because when uh, a director provide you a uh, a role for a movie, you are a perfect chameleon and if I can uh, uh, give you uh, a, a two thumbs up for for that that's pretty cool because you th this is a distinguished for uh, for for that and this is super cool so um, thank you very much I, uh, I, the people I admire are, I call it transformational acting yeah I really admire people who can literally become become unrecognizable into something else. Um, I, if I think of females, it's like Kate Blanchett uh, can do that. Sean Penn in, in Sean Penn in his career, Robert De Niro, uh, those guys, Marlon Brando, they, they all are transformational actors as opposed to say an, uh, an icon star type of person uh, like Gary Cooper, great movie star, or, or um, I'm trying to think, but they really are staying in one lane uh, as opposed to somebody who transforms uh, like uh, Daniel Day-Lewis mm -hmm. into somebody completely different. So uh, the biggest challenge is as a working actor, you have to do that very quickly. You have to be able to, you get material eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, and the next morning you've got to be able to become wow. someone else by, say, ten o'clock when you go into audition. So wow. you get really skilled at being able to do it yeah. uh, if you're a working actor for any length of time. Wow, super cool. And uh, after your experience on that uh, Warrant, Um, you working in 1995, you play a, another villain uh, in uh, Three Ninjas uh, Knuckle Up. What do you think about this movie um, compared to the first one? Because I remember that that's my opinion, but for example, the, the, the first Harry Potter, the first Ninja Turtles, the first Ghostbuster is, for my opinion, uh, the best one. But yeah, sometimes it's different. But you know, go ahead. <laughs> well, like you know, I I, to, I can't really comment because uh, I've never seen the first one. 
Okay, okay, okay. I've never, I've never seen the first one. Okay. To do that movie for me was a lot of fun. I imagine, um, yeah. Because a lot of movies that I, I had young sons at the time, and they really couldn't watch uh, a lot of the stuff I was in, so I was grateful to be in it. I had a, a lot of fun doing it because it's kind of a zany part. I don't know if you noticed, but the, the costumes I wear... I spent. Uh, I went to Western shops and spent mm -hmm. a lot of time, which I usually do, on whatever the character is wearing. I had a lot of fun. I look back on it now and I think, wow, how agile I was because I moved around very uh, easily in the movie. And also there are some great people. Donald Logue is in the movie, and he went on to have a really good career, still does. Um so I had a lot of fun, and Charles Napier was, uh, of course, a veteran um, character actor in the movie. A lot of fun. It was a unique movie, uh, in, in my experience, for one reason, especially it was a Korean director who didn't speak English. And okay. So, so uh, when he gave instructions, it had to be translated by a, a colleague to the rest of us. So, okay. And of course, the kids were fantastic. You know, the, the kids are fantastic. Maria so, or Maria let, me, let me just turn it's that a, off. It's a blooper. <laughs> Maria, let me call you on, my, on air. I'll okay. call you right now. It's uh, my trusty Maria who helps me do everything. Okay. No problem, my friend. So uh, I, uh, Okay. So yeah. it was kind of a, a, a zany uh, experience. I imagine. And, uh, I had fun. I try to have fun in any gym. And that's the thing. You're going from something that's a cowboy movie to a sci-fi movie to, in that case, a kid's movie. Um, I've got a movie coming out called Nessie, uh, about okay. the Loch Ness Monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, family fair, you know, anybody can go and see it. And that's kind of rare because usually I'm doing these violent action movies. And uh, it's nice to have a little change of pace and have something that kids can go to and uh, mothers and fathers can take their kids to. So. And for the last question, go ahead. Okay. Uh, how have you been approached by uh, the great Steven Spielberg to play with the famous actor, Tom Cruise in the Minority Report movie in 2022? <clears throat> yeah, it was a very, I call it a golden Hollywood moment. Uh, I've had a couple of them, but I didn't audition for that. I didn't meet Steven Spielberg. Really? Wow. I, uh, I was on the show Dark Angel. Okay. And I was playing a reoccurring character in that movie. And, um, uh, And my agent called one day and he said, come over to the office. And I thought I'd done something really bad and I was going to get punished. But um, I went over there and he said, Steven Spielberg called and wants to hire you for four months. And I guess because Dark Angel, I was thinking, I was like, Steven Spielberg watches Dark Angel? You know, but then I realized, well, of course, Dark Angel is a James Cameron show. So, uh, of course, Steven Spielberg and James Cameron would watch each other's work. So uh, it was a, a great thing. And, and boom, the next thing I knew, I was on Minority Report for four months. So, uh, um, I, you know, it's, it doesn't get really better than that. Little movies and independent films are a lot of fun. And sometimes you're, it's creative and you're winging it and stuff. But as far as big studio movies, Minority Report and Eraser and things like that are about as the top of a food chain. So for ending, <laughs> uh, as usual, uh, my partner, Benoit, a.k.a. Uh, Nostradamus, Ben, try to predict the future of our guests. So go ahead, my friend. First of all, first of all uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kilpatrick, for the interview. It was uh, a pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure, too. Um, am I, should I be scared about the future? <laughs> okay. Uh, 
you are a good actor. But, uh, I predict to you, uh, you're going to have your uh, your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame uh, in a few years. Oh, well, that's a great prediction. Thank you very much. I'll take it. I wish you very, very, very uh, well. Thank so, you. And I wish you guys great. And, uh, you're awesome. You know, you're, you're speak English so well. And I, I studied French for about, I don't know, seven or eight years in high school and stuff in college. Okay. But I, I don't speak it all that well. But unless I go to a place uh, that speaks French, uh, like St. Bart's or Cannes Film Festival or something like that. Okay. So I always appreciate uh, the French accent. It's a big part of my growing up. Thank you so much, honestly. And do you speak a little French or? Je suis enchanté avec toi. Oh, oh yeah, that's hey, that, that's pretty cool. Thank you so much, and uh, we try to be uh, better and better uh, in English because we know uh, that our English is not so perfect. But you know, this is super cool that you uh, take uh, 25 minutes déjà uh, with us. So this is super appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. We are very grateful. Bonjour. Bonjour and have a great day, my friend. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye. Goodbye.